Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at The Real Science Exchange. As all dairy producers are looking for ways to be more profitable, maximizing component production, and improving feed efficiency is top of mind for everyone at the dairy. Back in September, we were joined by Dr. Mike Van Amberg from Cornell University for one of our most popular webinars on the Real Science Lecture Series to date. He gave us an overview of what has changed in the new CNCPS version 7. You can uh, view his full webinar at balchem.com slash real science. But today we get to sit down with Mike and two of his uh, guests that he brought with him today and dig a little bit deeper into the new uh, version 7. So welcome back, Mike. Uh, good to have you back here. Hey, Scott. Great to be back. Good to see you, yeah. everyone. Yeah. And so this is not your first time at the pub, so you kind of know the drill. So what's in your glass tonight? Uh, just a second. I have some um, in my real science class here. I have some Avalor, which is a space side scotch. I think that's the first you had that on the very first uh, podcast as well, if I am correct. I think that's probably true. Uh, every time I'm talking about the CNCPS or anything related to feed chemistry, I get that <laughs> because Pete Van Seust would call that a pedestrian scotch. Uh, and uh, so in his honor, I'm going to drink another pedestrian scotch. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Mike, you brought a couple guests with you tonight. Would you mind introducing those guys? And uh, how'd you how'd you get to know them? Yeah, Rob Bender and Mike DeGroot. Um, got to know them. Well, I think I knew Rob when he was a grad student yet. So that says a little bit about right. both of yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> so I've known I've known them both a long time. Uh, you know, primarily I know them now as uh, really good nutritionists in the field, both uh, using some as or one version of the CNCPS or another, right? So that's that's really how I interface with them now. Very well, uh, Rob. Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your business, and uh, and maybe how when if you can remember when you first met Mike. Yeah, I think I maybe first met Mike at uh, Dairy Challenge when I was in grad school. I was involved in uh, coaching the UW Madison uh, Dairy Challenge team. There it is. Maybe I met where I met Mike. Uh, not entirely sure, um, but I'm a nutritionist with GPS Dairy Consultant based out of Watertown, Wisconsin, halfway between Milwaukee and Madison. Um, I spend my time in Wisconsin and Lower Michigan, and our team of uh, twenty. Uh, works predominantly in the Midwest, and then we get outside the Midwest a little bit to, to other parts of uh, the United States and uh, across the uh, the world a little bit as well. Very well. And then our next guest, uh, uh, Mike DeGroot. Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been a long time since I met Mike Van Amberg. It was back in 2003. I was in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, defending the and him and some other very esteemed colleagues were sitting in the front row with their arms crossed looking at me. So <laughs> I did get to meet him after I presented in the open relationship with him. That's, um, I'm out here in California. I do work in California and Colorado myself, and I have two partners out here with Edge Dairy Consulting. And we just brought a fourth guy on who's uh, just starting with us. So we're hoping to turn him loose on some cows here in the next year or so. Um, yeah, it's been a great opportunity to work with Mike on this in the model and uh, looking forward to the discussion today. And finally, I've got my co-host back, the lovely and talented uh, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Uh, Clay, you know the drill. What's in your glass tonight? Uh, I'm traveling today, so water today. Okay. All right. Uh, what's in your glass? Well, tonight I went back to kind of one I've been uh, hitting uh, recently. It's Yellowstone, right? And so... I love that show. And so I love to, you know, get myself a, you know, a nice uh, a snifter here of some Yellowstone and, and enjoy the, the show. So I had that uh, on Sunday and, and having it again today. So you know, in, a, in a rut. So anyway, that's that's what I'm having today. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. 
Uh, Mike, to get us started, big question of the day is uh, when are we going to have version 7 available to us? Yep, Scotty, that is the question of the moment. Um, and we're working as hard as we possibly can. Uh, where we're at right now, you know, and I'm I'm pretty transparent and honest about this. The So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, just some background to understand where we're at. Up until now, the CNCPS IP <laughs> was in a spreadsheet, right? A spreadsheet that's about 30 years old. Uh, it's a big, really ugly thing, but when somebody would get a license, we would hand them the spreadsheet, which meant they basically had to rebuild the model in their software and then, re and then build their interface, right? So pretty sophisticated, a lot of work. Version seven um, is way, way, way beyond that kind of technology. We built it in Vensim. Um, we, um, there's, there's about 10 times as many equations in version seven as there was in any of the prior versions, simply because of all the interactions with everything. So what we're doing now, and the reason it's taking so long, and we'll come back to this, but what we have to do now is we actually have to build it into some sort of a software platform. We're not going to make the interface. My uh, antique term would be a DLL, essentially. So we're going to build the DLL, and then we're going to hand that to all the licensees. We'll give them the input addresses and the output addresses. So it, it will be a package thing. They won't be able to open up. There'll be nobody playing in the code anymore uh, because it's just too sophisticated. Right? There's too many interactions. Uh, and that's what's taking so long. Uh, that that's really what's it's led to this real lag now because you know it used to be that we could just throw it in the spreadsheet and send it out to everybody and lickety split we're done now all of a sudden we've got this process of being partly a software shop right and we're 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 gonna not do this because we're not that good at software development uh, um, but we've been working with a company first we had to find a company we found a company um, Andrew Lapierre He's working in a postdoc as a postdoc right now. He He's leading that effort. We're hoping when all this is done that by May, by May, we have that part done that we can then ship to the license holders. Mm. So if anybody's wondering how complicated that architecture is, <laughs> it was on slide five of your real science lecture back in September. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and that was only one section of it. I didn't show all the submodels. That was only the rumen. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's not moving, you know, it's not moving nearly as fast as uh, what Andrew and I had, had anticipated. Um, getting somebody to actually be able to do this and do it effectively has been more of a challenge than we expected and, and quite frankly to have the resources to do it you know we, we had to go find pretty substantial financial resources um from the industry uh to to get this done because i you know we've got several bids and they all came in and you know you're not talking millions but you're talking parts of a million and then much more than our budget would ever allow so yeah so that's where we're at there's obviously a lot that goes into uh, creating a, a new version. Uh, would you mind kind of just kind of giving us a very top line idea of the process you go through? How do you know it's time for a new version? And then what are kind of some of the big steps, you know, um, that you, you go through uh, in, in getting it to the field? The, the CNCPS is actually kind of a unicorn in that regard. Um, because some of what we're some of what we're doing, you know, is there's there's a little bit in there that's probably 30 years old, um, right? There's a little legacy information in there that we build on as we go. So how do we do it, uh, Scott? I think in the end, um, I think the last step is do the cows do the cows in the model agree? If we if we give if we put some diets together. And we do what I call boundary testing. I'll use Andrew Lapierre's one of his PhD um, studies. You know, we have this optimum, what we call an optimum amino acid profile on an mCal per gram basis. Um, but if you look at the data that we develop that from, there's a range around that, right? There's the standard error, standard deviation, 
So, so one of the studies that we ran, and this is how we feel like we're we're making progress, is you know Andrew went down one standard deviation uh, based on that data for all essential amino acids, and then we went up one standard deviation, and then we had our optimums, and we ran that study and looked at what the cows said, you know, and the cows told us, hey, you know what, if you go down one standard deviation, I'm not going to be as productive. If you run at your optimums, I'm pretty productive. If you go much above the optimums, I actually don't really care, right? Which told us, yeah, you could probably add a little bit more, but economically, it's not going to be worth it, right? You don't have to feed 250 grams of lysine. <laughs> you can get away with 220, right? Uh, and that we walked away from that saying, hey, you know, these optimums as a starting point for a first generation version of this model look pretty good, right? The cows in the model agree. So, you know, that's that's one example, Scott, that you know, helps everybody understand what we think we need to do to make sure that this thing is ready. And especially on that topic, right? It, it's, um, you know, my joke used to be feed a cow like a pig, right? But that that actually is one of the ways that they formulate amino acids for swine is uh, grams per mcal. So, so we we accomplished that. Um, boy, we better test it really, really well before you tell everybody else they can go out and do it. Very well, Mike. One more question from me, and I'm going to turn it over to the the consultants to to dig a little deeper. But uh, during your uh, webinar, you talked a little bit about what were the significant things that changed <clears throat> with this new version, or will change with this new version. So why don't you give us a, a bit of an overview uh, of that, and then I'll ask the consultants to kind of dig into each of those areas a little bit more. Well, the first thing we did, and again, some of this big picture stuff, we converted the model to a nitrogen basis. Um, so in effect, we're moving away from the concept of crude protein. We'll bring it to the surface so people feel comfortable with diets, but but establishing the model on a nitrogen basis um, actually helped us a lot as you move um, nitrogen through the compartments, right? So if a cow consumes 700 grams of nitrogen, 700 grams had to enter the rumen, it now has to leave, 700 grams have to leave the rumen in some form or another. The basic principles of soluble, insoluble, degradable, that kind of stuff are still there. But when you don't do it as a percent, right, which is a ratio essentially, all of a sudden, it allows you to reconcile those amino acids much better as you get to the small intestine and towards the mammary gland. So that cleaned up a bunch of noise. Um, and, and, as, and, and because feed as it degrades, forages especially, you know, 6.25 doesn't work as you remove carbohydrate and protein from the structure of a plant and you get more to the indigestible material. So again, there's some non-uniformity in all of those things. So you, you, you kind of have to do some kind of three-dimensional math in your head on that one. But we, we did that. I think the other thing, you know, the, the other couple big things that are different, uh, we invoke this three-pool model of NDF digestibility. You know, we will now have a fast pool, a slow pool, and the, and the UNDF. And we, even though that's been in the field now for a while, we can't really actualize it um, as well as, as what we'll be able to in seven. And that's, that's really, that was really, um, the, when we finally figured, you know, we've kind of known that there probably wasn't a, a homogenous pool, you know, even though we didn't really, nobody ever treated it as different digestible pools. That was probably the, the biggest thing we could have done to resolve the amino acids, um, and the, and the supply of amino acids. And um, because it, if you look at any, at least in our hands, the factor that affects amino acid supply the most is digestible NDF. Um, has nothing to do with amino acids or protein. So multiple pool NDF, having the protozoa in there, cleaning that all up. Um, let's see, what else? Get, getting, oh, well, just getting all the nitrogen pools, full recycling, and all the nitrogen pools together so so we can actually do much better accounting and that allows us to improve the nitrogen efficiency and then i think the you know the last big step uh, the big difference from 655 is how we resolve the amino acid requirements there's probably something that i'm leaving out but those are the big ones 
we'll be able to do fill in flux. I think there we go. The the user, and this is not to this is not to sound like I don't like something, but we do a lot of decision making off particle size. And there's nothing wrong with particle size, except most of our particle size discussions are in the absence of how much NDF is actually in the room at any one time. You know, and we, we don't actually think about that when we're thinking about particle size. We just get focused on, well, the particles aren't big enough. And, and I want to know, you know, well, how many grams of NDF are actually in the room? And is that really what the problem is, not the particle size? So in this version, because of how we have these calculations set up, um, Rob and Mike, are actually going to be able to say, hey, my the rumens on these cows should hold about 82 or 8,500 grams of NDF at steady state. And if their diets are, are formulated and it says, oh, they're only going to be at 7,400 or 7,600, and all of a sudden we know that rumen's not really full of NDF, and that may be partly what's causing acidosis and poor feed efficiencies and not just the particle size. So we're going to hopefully add more information to that kind of decision making. You know, I recall a discussion you had on uh, with protozoa and modeling that as well. Can you talk a little bit about that, Mike, and, and how that's different than uh, before? Yeah, protozoa in the original model, you know, the original um, CNCPS submodel was the, the primary architect on the microbe side uh, was Jim Russell. And Jim was a brilliant microbiologist. Um, he did not like protozoa because he couldn't figure out how to isolate them and grow them up and manipulate them. So anyhow, we had had protozoa in protozoa here are kind of ghosted in to the in, in version six and all the prior versions as just something that consumes bacteria. So the so the growth rate on a bacteria, the maximum growth rate is 0.5 grams. Uh, bacteria per gram of carbohydrate per hour. Um, and, and what those guys came up with, and this was probably a, a Jim, Charlie, Pete Van Seuss decision-making process, was, well, they're going to eat so many of the bacteria. So instead of growing 0.5 grams per gram of carbohydrate per hour, we're going to grow 0.4 grams per gram of carbohydrate per hour. So they basically said, hey, these bugs are going to grow up. Um, and then the bacteria or the protozoa are going to eat them, but they're not actually going to be delivered to the small intestine. And, you know, so there's this little black box thing going on there. Now we've actually added them to the model and we have to have them eat bacteria now. <laughs> so they actually have to predate and then they have to flow out. So that, that was actually, that was one of the things, if you want any one thing that took us a whole nother PhD to solve, it was that because we had no idea how to reconcile that interaction until we went and did played with some Irish cows. Mike, were we underestimating then or how was that working? Yeah, yeah, no, good question, Mike. We grossly underestimated the little buggers and we, um, it, it, when we built the sub model and I, I know, um, I know Jan Dykstra, had to struggle with this, but I never really understood Jan's model and how he set that up because he's got protozoa in there. But we had to figure out, do they flow with the liquid passage rate or the solid passage rate, right? And in the absence of any information, we associated them with the solids because that's how the bacteria flow. So the moment we started trying to formulate diets, uh, we couldn't get an MP prediction that made any sense because the protozoa weren't flowing out appropriately and they were hanging around in the room and just eating all the bacteria so so we had like a up to a 40 pound bias on mp prediction off our data <laughs> we're like where did that come from well it was those crazy protozoa who were just you know over overcompensating right so we just we had to find data that actually allowed us to predict that flow so now we know that they're you know, in those pasture cows of Mike Deneen's, they were 20, 20 to 23 percent of the of the microbial flow, which was the most, which was in in a protos, in those cows. That means they're about 20 uh, percent of the amino acid flow. So it's a lot. Mike, I'm going to go out on a limb here of my 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 knowledge, but it's my understanding that uh, protozoa are also involved with 
methane production. And I'm just kind of curious if, if there's anything we know or can model relative to methane and protozoa. Yeah, yes, we can, Scott. Um, that that is on our radar. We have uh, we have we have a we have a bare bones model for that interaction. Protozoa make a lot of hydrogen. This is where this comes down to. Protozoa make a lot of hydrogen, and, and the archaea bacteria like to hang out with them and grab that hydrogen. So so that symbiosis is there. Um, I think that I'm, but I'm convinced the there was you know 20 years ago we wanted to to uh, defaunate the rumens, get rid of all the protozoa. I am convinced that that would actually all, all of our data say so far that that's not a good thing. So we we just want to keep the protozoa, keep them happy. We got to figure out how to do something else to the to the methanogens. But yep, there's an interaction there. Version eight. Yeah, no, it'll be version seven. No, no. Oh, okay. I, I'm at it. I'm at it. Speaking of older age, yeah, we're we're contemporaries, right? I'm <laughs> I'm I don't anticipate a version eight coming out. Um, at least not in my watch. But but I do think we can work on those interactions, Scott. That is a good point, and we are. There's a concerted effort. I spent my morning and four hours of meetings that get at something like that. So yes, there's a lot of people that want to figure out how to 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 make some nutritionally have some impact on methane production. Mm -hmm. Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you currently use uh, CNCPS um, in your practice? Yeah, we've used uh, CNCPS for uh, quite a while on our team. So when I joined the team in 2015, we've uh, we had been using it already and a few years before that as well, from my understanding. Um, yeah, we do all our rations through CNCPS modeling uh, through NDS platform. Um, and we do quite a bit of group uh, share, group uh, experience ration share, uh, different type things like that on a monthly basis to try and uh, compare notes related to modeling outputs uh, as it applies to practical uh, on-farm things going on that influence uh, influence the model. So. So yeah, we use it on a regular basis. And so as you look toward uh, version seven, what what kinds of things are you looking forward to uh, and capabilities that maybe you don't have today? Yeah, one of the things I wanted to dig into a little bit with Mike is uh, the fiber digestion models and uh, and you know your comments about slow pool, fast pool, UNDF. Um, Mike, what? what are the impacts of different UNDF time points, either from the endpoint stand, the standpoint, the 120, 240 kind of concept versus, you know, a 30 hour UNDF or any of that kind of stuff. What are the impacts of, of either selection of those different criteria on forage analyses or, um, you know, yeah, the ones you're using to formulate the diet. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, so so how did we come up with the, some of the numbers that we use, and how is that evolving? That's also a, kind of a, an interesting side topic. So, so when we when we hatched this idea, uh, the Europeans were ahead of us um, in terms of publication, and, and I've got a bunch of stories, but you know, um, save the stories. The Northern Europeans had. Um, about the same time we were doing it in the lab, these guys had come up with uh, an in-situ process where they put five grams in a bag, put it in the cow, and it took them 288 hours to get to a UNDF, right? Um, what was exciting about that, at least from my perspective, uh, was that they could find a UNDF and it had nothing to do with the surface area calculations that Conrad, St. Pierre, and Weiss, and Van Soest all came up with, right? So the 2.4 times lignin and all those things, you know, to, for better or for worse, it invalidated them and said, hey, there's, there's, some, there's some dynamic biology going on here that doesn't fit the chemistry. So that emboldened us to keep doing it, and that's where we got to the 240. We had to come up with something that a commercial lab could do because nobody's going to run in situs all the time. The reason we ended up at 240 
in application was because when you talk to the commercial labs and you ask them how well characterized are those samples that are sent in, and they say, sometimes we don't know what it is, it just gives us a chemistry, right? Which is why some of these labs now take pictures of everything to make sure that, you know, you know that's what they received. Because those are, you know, it'll be green and it might be ground or not ground. You don't know what percent alfalfa it is, what percent grass. The 240 number was an insurance factor to say, no matter what, this is where we hit a true U, no matter what it is, okay? Now, if you back up the curve now, the correlation between 120 and 240 is very high. So we probably could learn to predict that now that we have so many thousands of samples run. And, and we've recognized that. Um, but at the time, this was such a new concept that we had to stick to our, our principled approach and say, we know you get the real answer here, right? As you back up the curve, now you start getting into really interesting information. You know, um, I would have advocated for a 12 hour, you know, I was advocating for 24 hours and the industry said, no, we're not going to do that because we don't have any NIR equations. And I said, that gives us the best number and we know we're always in the fast pool. And they said, no, we, we've got our NIR equations for 30 hour, that's our compromise. I said, okay, then we went 31, 20, 240, right? And that would give us the three pools. Well, now, what's everybody asking for? For corn silage especially, everybody wants a 12 hour. Okay, you know what's fun about that is we've learned enough now to recognize that biologically, that's a good number. And it's not just noise. Because when I advocated 12 hours, I had the, and I'll say this out, I had some of my colleagues, I won't name names, I had some of my colleagues telling me that's because you're not good at your in vitros. And I said, well, I don't believe that to be true. Um, so we, we tested that and it wasn't true. It was real biology. And um, so now we're going to 12 hours. So one of the most important numbers we could have for any forage moving ahead is a 12 hour number, as long as the lab has got good methods, right? And there's no lag in it. Um, 30 hour works, you know, 30 hour in some of these forages is at the inflection point between the first and the second pool, if it's a high quality forage. Um, you know, alfalfa especially, can hit you by 96 hours, depending upon the leaf to stem ratio. But again, I think most of these labs don't know if they've got a pure alfalfa, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how much leaf is in there versus stem. So there's still this, this uh, kind of um, unknown when we send those samples into some of these labs and we're not always good at characterizing it. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I answered your question completely, but I know, I know with really high quality forages, uh, we need that early time point to better estimate how it's going to fill an empty. That fast pool is highly correlated with room and emptying. Uh, and if we don't get that right, um, we can have problems. If we don't know the true U, uh, we can hit fill effect on U2. On, on, oh, uh, we can hit fill effect on the U not knowing how large it is, right? I've seen that happen in, in various places around the country and the world. I, I found it interesting to that point. I found it interesting that our industry has spent so much time trying to figure out the UNDF pool, right? Whether it's 120 or 240 or whatever, getting away from the 2.4 times lignin concept and spent a lot of time on the UNDF piece, but really all the action is happening on the front end of the curve, right? And that's kind of what you're talking about. Um, yep. But I, I guess to your, you know, your point, it's been hard enough to to truly understand the UNDF without even so we can figure out potentially digestible fiber rate right? without even getting to the digestion rates on the front end of it. But I, I would imagine that's more and more where we'll be heading in the future, right? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. If you want to, you know, I'll come back to the Irish pasture grass. Boy, we need it. We need it. By 24 hours, you're almost at the inflection point on some of those exactly. really good grasses, right? So a 12 hour is absolutely necessary, but we have some good forages here that behave the same way. And, and that information I think can be really useful. And I think in the future will help us a lot. 
And I'm, I'm glad we've progressed to that point that we're in, and I'm glad that the NIR, I'm sincerely glad everybody embraced it, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, because I think it can be really useful in the end. Um, and, and as we got more information, we realized when we didn't have to do a lot of wet chemistry all the time that we could actually start to do this with the NIR and then it became rapid and less intensive and more cost effective. Rob, are you looking at grams of, of UNDF in the ration? Or are you, you guys looking at that number? That's something we've been kind of focused on here lately. Uh, we're playing around with the earlier time points as well, but we've been kind of set on 30, 120, and 240 as we're moving forward. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Watching that number has been interesting. So we we do look at it. Um, there's times when the changes that uh, I think that I see don't reflect cow performance changes, and I'm not sure exactly why that is. I think things like um cotton seed may influence that a little bit and there might be some other things you know different forage different forages but yeah i would definitely agree mike i mean that that is the focus point but the times where it doesn't match up with cow performance can be frustrating because you you think you're seeing a change and it may not be real well and that kind of brings me into my next question so and rob and i did not plan this but uh <laughs> version seven is is you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work on trying to evaluate these feedstuffs that we're feeding and feed libraries and stuff like that. Are we updating that? How, how are you guys going about that in version seven? Uh, yep. That's a very crucial part. I think we do a great job as an industry on forages, but like Rob mentioned on cottonseed or anything like that, we've had a hard time getting to work with some of these labs and we're, and we're getting it done. But um, how do we evaluate these feedstuffs moving forward? Yeah. So I, I second what you just said. Um, the, the industry is doing a lot of work and we don't have all the information on the non-forage fiber sources. We have some, um, I had a grad student a few years ago, um, that paper is actually uh, about ready to submit, um, but it's a snapshot, right? We did, all the, we did as many non-forage fiber sources as we could get our hands on, um, but we need more information on those. They behave differently than a forage there's no slow pool um, because there's no cross-linking. They don't have to do that structurally. So you just basically have a digestible pool and an indigestible pool. I think the harder part about some of that cotton seed being one of them, or that's not a homogenous thing. You know, you've got two different types of fiber that can be digested. Um, and you got a passage rate issue, right? So when you guys tell me it doesn't work, uh, you know, when I hear that, and I've heard it, and I'm we are we are trying to figure out how to manage it. You know, if you call it a concentrate, it's going to go to a faster passage rate in the model. I'm not sure right now we have, especially in six five, we can put in the right kind of digestibility. In seven, you will be able to do that, right? Because it, you'll get the two pool behavior where there's a digestible pool, and and then it just plateaus out to indigestible um but we are we are building that feed library we're building that into the current feed library we need more data actually just before i got on this call andrew for very different reasons said you know uh we probably are at a point where we got to go back and pull the data sets uh, redo the data sets that we did for the 2015 paper update it and add all this information in uh to get it right and um, so that would that would lend to your comment there that sometimes it doesn't always add up, and I think that's just because we're we're missing some information, or or the structure of the current model just doesn't know how to make best use of it. How's that? The same on amino acids too, Mike. Right? Like on these commodities. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Uh, um, I've got a grad student right now who's part of his PhD has been learning to master this crazy expensive mass spec that I have in my lab. Um, um, but there's there's actually no, um, we, our HPLC methods have kind of failed us here lately. Um, so we've moved, we, we upgraded our lab to a, to a mass spec, an LC mass spec. But when we did that, we realized, hey, there's no standardized method for getting amino acids out of that machine. 
So his PhD has been building that system. Uh, so now what we've got to do is we've got to start lining up all these feedstuffs and start running them through there to make sure that we have captured some of the variability around the amino acid content of some of these, you know, forages are easy, soybean, canola, those things, you know, we, we, we don't have to do much work there, but it's all the other things now that we're throwing in front of a cow that we don't have characterized. Yeah. Yeah. I think from a, you know, Mike DeGroote from, from the standpoint of just understanding the commodities, right. I mean, just macronutrients on commodities, making sure it matches up with feed library and the differences you might see is important let alone the modeling end of things. Yeah, um, that that's, um, it's interesting you guys bring that up because to to, to Scott's point about um, protozoa and methane and everything else, there's a lot of pressure to port the CNCPS to lots of other places in the world <laughs> and trying to try, you know, India, right? I'm being asked right now to really engage India, right? I And I, there's reasons that you say yes, and there's reasons that you say no. One of the reasons, but what that does for us, you know, to, to your question here, guys, and Andrew worked this up for them. So one of my colleagues is over in India right now, um, talking to the National Dairy Development Board. And they said, if we want to build our own library over here for our Indian conditions, what's it gonna cost? Well, to be able to run an NIR comfortably, you need at least a thousand wet chemistry samples, right? Just to be able to have enough data to get a good equation. Um, and and they gave us a. They said, well, we've got we've got a quarter of a million dollars. How much can we get done? <laughs> you know, the sad truth is, if you're going to run those wet chemistry at 125 bucks a piece, you can do two feeds. So a quarter of a million dollars to fully characterize two feeds to be able to have robust NIR equations. You know, and I think about the, you know, and that, that gives me pause. I have to be honest with you guys. Sometimes I don't stop to think about what's in this crazy thing that even though I work with it every day, we've got a feed library with 1,200 feeds in it. Um, and some of these forages, and then you, so you think about how much it would cost to build that feed library. It's millions. Yeah. It's it's tens of millions of dollars, and we take that for granted. And um, I'm now learning not to take it for granted. And you say, well, how the hell did we get here? And we says, well, we did it over 30 years in bits and pieces, right? So if you add up 30 years of work, maybe you get to those dollar values. Anyhow, it's really interesting. But but that also begs the question, so if we have to build this library, Mike and Rob, how the hell are we going to get it done? Who's who's? Can we get the producers of those things? Will the cotton board pay for some of that feed chemistry? You know, will the almond board pay for some of that feed chemistry? Because, I, you know, they're the ones that are trying to get rid of the byproducts. So if we can get them to actually ante up, then it's not too bad. But I, I don't. I have a relationship with the almond board sort of, but not anybody else. So it'll be interesting to see how we can get this done. So Mike, globally, is the is the feed chemistry there globally for the CNCPF model? Yeah, I think so, Clay. Um, in the US, North America is good. Um, uh, there's good labs, there's good labs down in South America and there's some really good labs in Europe now. They're mostly all, one of the shortcomings is a lot of those labs are solely uh, um, NIR. There's there's some wet chemistry labs over there, but what I'm learning about the wet chemistry labs is they still can't quite get some of the basic chemistry done correctly, so they can't get their NIRs to work right. And I won't, I won't name names, but there's a couple of them that we're trying to figure out how to help that, you know, if, if we do the same sample, we can be we can be 10 to 20 units off on NDF, All right? So, so there's, and, and I think that's simply because for some of those labs and for some of the people over there, NDF is still a new thing, All right? It's they're, they're coming out of the, uh, this, the, some labs that still run crude fiber. A lot of labs that run crude fiber. Yeah. 
yeah. in Europe. So yeah, so we there's a little hiccup there, Clay, but you know, we're making progress. We're making progress. Mike, a bit of a curveball. We're talking about the different forages in places like uh, India, but what about different species like water buffalo? How, how relevant is your biology to water buffalo? <laughs> <laughs> have you have do you have have you been walking around the hallway here, Scotty of Morrison Hall? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> but I have been drinking some bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> to send me a bottle after that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yes. The the request the request is there, Scott, that we we actually build a water buffalo model. You know what? And it's not going to be that hard because the rumen's the rumen. The only difference is a water buffalo is a boss indicus, so they don't, they, they just, you got to kind of deal with them like you would any animal from that, uh, that side. And they got a slower metabolism rate, they got a lower maintenance requirement. Um, we just have to build that all together. Mm -hmm. And there, there are data out there. NDS actually, um, because they originate in in, in uh, Italy, they actually have a Mediterranean water buffalo model, so you can formulate a diet for a lactating water buffalo. And I know where they got their data, so I can I can do that if I have to. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that wasn't on my to do list, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of them out there, Mike. Yeah. Uh, are you know, and that's a requirement to your to your question that is a requirement for india yeah if we're going to be in india doing this with cncps they do they do have a lot of crossbred cattle there's a lot of indigenous cattle that have been crossed with jerseys and holstein um uh, but there's a there's an awful lot of water buffalo too that you have to take care of yeah quick story i was at the uh, western dairy management conference several years ago and we had a, a big meeting with uh, folks from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh was there, and um, they said, Scott, we want you to set beside this one very large dairyman uh, uh, for dinner tonight. And I had, a, so I sat down and, and had, uh, was having dinner, and then I decided to ask him, so I understand you're a dairyman. Uh, how many cows do you have? And he just kind of looks at me like, I don't have any cows. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were a dairyman. I am. <laughs> <laughs> 4,000 water buffalo that he milked twice a day by hand. So it's interesting. Yeah. World. Yep. The largest water buffalo dairy that I was on uh, south of Rome was 7,000. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And the guy quit his, he owned it. He quit his law practice because he made much more money milking his buffalo than he did being a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Very well. Clay, uh, any areas you want to dig into? So, Mike, we talked about fiber earlier. What about on the Stark side? Any any changes there? In version 7, there won't be any change immediately, Clay. Um, I, I will have a I will have a PhD student starting in January whose sole focus is starch. So I'm hoping um, in, you know, as we progress here, there's no expectation that she actually builds a new starch submodel, but the expectation is with the sponsor that we figure out a way to standardize the analysis and to be able to give better information back to somebody who's formulating a diet. And, um, you know, um, Cumberland Valley, Ralph Ward, you know, put out that soluble starch, you know, concept. And, and I, I, I looked it over and I know exactly what it means because we've seen the same thing. And I, but we don't know what that really is, right? Is that unpolymerized starch? Um, is it, um, yeah, we don't know. So we just, we really, need, we really need somebody to dig into that so we can get a much better handle on it. So we can model it hopefully a little bit better than we are. But right now we don't, we won't have any changes. Mike, on that same note, you mentioned sugar several times in your in your presentation. Um, 
you want to dig into that a little bit more? Yep. So we are, we are, yeah. Um, we are going to put out some information here. When we published a paper in 2015, and I can make this announcement here. When we published a paper in 2015, um, we put in water soluble carbohydrates. We were being pushed really hard by some other chemists to do that. The industry was kind of moving that way. Uh, what we've learned since then um, in, in all of this around feed chemistry is that probably is, is the wrong metric for the CNCPS right now. Uh, partially because if you use water soluble carbohydrates day in and day out, you're going to get negative soluble fiber pools. And that just confounds everything else that you're doing. So we're most likely going to, well, not most likely, we are going to go back to say we want everybody to use ethanol soluble carbohydrates. And then what's the by difference going to end up in the soluble fiber pool? And then for grasses, that's fructans. To extend that, though, we don't. This may be something that we embrace uh, with the student who's going to look at starch, uh, because I think starch is going to bring us over into the sugar realm a little bit. We're probably going to do some more critical thinking about, um, you know, five versus six carbon sugars, and, and where that plays into this whole thing. Um, that's a uh, Charlie Sniffen. Um, for years, Charlie Sniffen would ask me that question: When are you going to start looking at five versus six carbon sugars? Well, maybe now, Charlie, I don't know. We'll see. Again, that's the problem with all this stuff is, is as much as we think it's important is, and, is, is, and as interesting as it is, I don't know who pays the bill <laughs> to get it all done because it's not proprietary information, right? It's uh, something that everybody's going to use. Um, and it's hard to find money for those kinds of things. Um, but we we feel obligated to actually go look at some of that and i hope i can tie it on to some other things that we're doing here sugars have become really important in my diet formulation here lately especially as i think about pushing components and not just milk yield um and in our my northeast diets i can i can throw in a little bit of sugar along with everything else we're doing bring the starch down a little bit and actually push milk components um more effectively than just a little bit more starch so how, learning how to do that and being able to describe those sugars a little more effectively would be good and we know it boosts protozoa that's why those those pasture cows the protozoa uh proliferate so well and so fast is because there's you know there's 20 percent sugar in those pasture grasses well, and out here in my neck of the woods too, Mike, where we don't have ample fiber a lot of times, you know, we're pushing things like almond holes that you mentioned. So, you know, we've played with our sugar numbers, uh, trying to push those up as, as efficiently as we can. So, um, we kind of know the limit if you want to talk about it. So, yep. <laughs> so, what do you have? Okay. So, now that you open that door, how far can you go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious what you're finding in your, I, I, in your conditions. Yeah, I've ran up to 12%, and cows have been okay. No, nope, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. You know, it's that's the funny when you say that. That makes perfect sense to me because when you look at, I'll, I'll go back to the Irish cows. You know, they're 20 to 25% water soluble carbohydrates and 2% starch. It's it's completely opposite of what some of our TMRs are here, and the cows are ha happy as all get out, right, and making good components. Yeah, I was going to ask. You touched on protozoa again, and and you talked about it early on. I I wanted to dig into that a little bit more, if we could, because from a practicing nutritionist standpoint, what do we need to know about the model changes related to protozoa? Ah. I I can appreciate, I think, what you're saying around developing the model and everything you went through on the protozoa end, but what do we need to know out in the field related to protozoa? Yep. So, so right now, great question. Um, and it's been a frustration of mine around this whole sugar thing. Uh, we know when we add sugars to diets, I'm going to come back to that and then I'll get to the protozoa because I think the two things are tied together. When we add sugars to the diet, we do that for a couple different reasons. Sometimes we do it because we know for whatever reason it enhances fiber digestibility. And we don't fully understand that, but we can get, if you look at the literature carefully, when you add a little bit of sugar, you can get a little bit higher fiber digestibility. We know that it will enhance our, our components. We'll get some more butyrate, things like that. 
the primary sugar users in the rumen are the protozoa. And, and that's one of the things that people ask me all the time and say, hey, Mike, you know, I added some sugar to the diet, but my MP didn't change. Or maybe it changed, but it was a really small number. Why didn't that MP number go up? Why don't I see more microbial growth? And the reason you don't is that we're focused only on the bacteria and the pool that will really benefit from that sugar. One of them will be the protozoa. And so adding the protozoa to the submodel, when you add sugar, you should see this increase in microbial yield. And that will be one of the updates here is that, you know, when you when you see the MP supply or the amino acid supply, however it comes, however we, we throw it out there, um, you're going to see bacteria, protozoa, endogenous, you know, all these kinds of things uh, and broken out. So you'll you'll actually have the capacity to manipulate that pool because now we can feed it because it's there. And so to that point, I would imagine, you know, where Mike was talking before about his sugar levels out, out farther west, I would imagine it's quite a bit more impactful in, in those kind of markets, right, where your sugar levels are significantly higher than what we might see in uh, upper Midwest, for example. I mean, we're still feeding sugar. We feed a fair bit of it, but we're not at that kind of level typically. Right. Yep. Yeah. It will be very, should be very impactful at that point. Again, just removing the black box aspect of this whole thing and being able to give us more information. Hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's my, my joke is, you know, there's still, there's been quite a bit of art in ruminant nutrition and I'm trying to remove the art artist part of it and make it more quantitative so we can all see it. Right. Makes us all better artists. It's just that it becomes transparent now. Well, I'm going back to like body weight, for example. I mean, that's, huge portion of what goes into this model right and yeah that art versus science i agree with you mike on that is making sure those are correct inputs that we're putting in on our end so i hope with all of this technology that's coming out somebody figures out how to get a scale that works really well in and out of the parlor something like that not expensive but it shouldn't be as hard as it is to get that kind of a metric yeah it just shouldn't yeah. yeah, maybe using cull cow data isn't the best way to measure body weights, right? <laughs> um, no, no, generally not. <laughs> Although, you know, when the beef, when, when the, when the cow, cull cow price is better, we're sending some better cattle, so it's not all bad. <laughs> <laughs> not lately. Mike, as we... As we get toward the end of our time here, I'm kind of curious about what you see the future of the CNCS uh, CPS being, right? You said there won't be a version eight, or at least not on your uh, on your watch, but right, it's not going away. And so, where do you see it going ten years from now? And then, as a follow up, I'm going to ask the two consultants if they had a wish list, what would they like to see changed and updated, uh, whether it's from a usability perspective or or functionality, any of that. So, start with you, Mike. Okay. Um, so, so first off, one of the things we're going to add, and this is, I don't know if this is a version seven thing or just probably the last iteration of six, but it will follow along pretty closely. Uh, we will have a caffeine heifer model. Um, so we'll be kind of birth to death. And I was just on a call with a former grad student who's now, uh, I bought back some of his time to finish this. We started it and then he graduated and left and we never finished the full model. So we are working on that right now and um, trying to pull that together. So there'll be a full calf and heifer model uh, with the transition calf, right? We've got enough data to, 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 to build it through the weaning phase. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. I think the future, um, one of the things that we, you know, besides the methane, you know, the, the environment aspect of the CNCPS, um, getting to fatty acids. Um, so we're going to frame out, we're going to frame out fatty acids pretty quickly in this thing. We, the, the, the beauty of the current system is the, the framework is there. We now have the protozoa, the protozoa have a really interesting fatty acid profile. We've got a bunch of bacterial samples. So we're going to generate all that information. Um, and then, and then start to figure out, you know, I, I don't know if we'll go as far as all the biohydrogenation. But I'd, I'd like to get to the point where we could forward predict milk composition. And not, not that we're going to get to the point where I say, 
you know, it's going to be 4.79, just to the point where we'd say this diet should allow for an increase in milk fat. This diet may inhibit your milk fat, right? Just kind of a qualitative thing to get started with. If we get better at it than that, we'll see. Um, we tried doing that. I, I, I assembled, just like we have this informal fiber working group, I assembled what I called the fat guy working group. Um, just happened to be all guys at the time. Um, that would probably, I know that would change now. I recently and we got, all that remark. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a personal comment, Clay. Uh, <laughs> it was just their discipline. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so, so we had started down that road of trying to figure out how to frame out a fatty acid model, but then the, the amino acids ran right over it. Right. And, and that, that took priority. So I'm coming back to it now with version seven and we want to be able to get, you know, you guys have heard me say this before. I think the cow has a fatty acid requirement, just like she has an amino acid requirement, right? They're not just energy sources. Um, it's just like essential versus non-essential clay. <laughs> it's yep. the same kind of thing and and we just have to we have to start characterizing those in the appropriate manner so we can improve energetic efficiency you know the protozoa i'll come back to the protozoa when adam Locke was here as a postdoc all those years ago you know people were trying to get rid of the protozoa and adam and i were like we don't think that's a good idea and one of one of the reasons for that and we were going to run a study um we think we both had the idea that the protozoa are the essential fatty acid reservoir for the cow hmm. because she doesn't, she either, she can elongate some fatty acids, but she actually needs some essential fatty acids and, and they have a more eukaryotic, you know, cell wall, which would lead to um, more essential fatty acids. About the time we were about ready to pull the trigger on the study, um, um, oh, Dick Wallace. Richard Wallace at the Rowett Research Institute publishes a study showing exactly that, how the how the protozoa were engulfing these these fats and these lipids and then moving them downstream, right? Basically acting as a vector to the cow. So we never ran the study. So that 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 kind of stuff, we want to be able to get to that level of detail because I think that will help us figure out how to modify milk composition, how to improve uh, if just efficiency of use of nutrients on behalf of the cow. Um, other big things, 10 years from now, um, here's a left-hand idea. And I wasn't the guy, I was definitely not the person to come up with this. So we're sitting with a bunch of software architects and they're looking at the structure of the CNCPS. And one guy was being really quiet. <laughs> And he said, and, and, and uh, there's several other people who have parroted this to me now. They said, you know what? We think we can eliminate the human in this process, just looking at your model. And I said, well, that would be interesting. How the hell are you going to do that? He goes, well, he says, looking at what you need and what has to happen and what this model would do, he said, we could put this in the cloud. And he goes, an AI system could do all of your diet formulation. You feed the information and it, it spits everything back out and then it learns, right? Because Rob would send stuff to the cloud and Mike would send stuff to the cloud. And eventually this AI system would learn, what do we know? What do we don't know? What's the most important metrics? Because it'd be using this mass amount of data. Um, and then we would just be facilitating all of that. That's intriguing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell it means, but the software guys uh, can see it. Um, so yeah, maybe in 10 years, this is running in a cloud someplace and it's informed me you because know, the other thing about that conversation was it would inform our research about what we should go focus on because they, they can't, we can't identify what's causing this outcome in the cows. Interesting. Anyhow, so, yeah. So Rob and Mike, what kind of, uh, if, if you were to give Mike some pointers on what needs to be in, uh, this or the next version, what, what might that be? About a year on the calf and heifer deal, but uh, I'm glad to hear that it's coming out. So, um, it's definitely been on my wish list. You know, one of the things that we're seeing in our industry too is, is more and more of this data. So some interaction with some of the, you know, SCR callers or things like that. So tying in the rumination side of to what we're actually doing. I think that's a big step as we move forward. And also with our feed programs too, with our feed management 
software that we have on farms, being able to have some interaction with that. And I know that's been talked about and coming down the road, but those are some of the things that I see on the wish list moving forward. Hmm. Good input. Yeah, those are, taking, those are really taking good. notes on this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I think you need to have a, a a system where if you have the inputs incorrect into the the uh, formulation, a hand reaches out and slaps your face a little bit because I don't I don't know how many times the inputs are incorrect and it just drives me nuts. I know you preach it over and over, and yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> No, I would. Uh, I I like the comments uh, on the integration with uh, SCR rumination or some of that kind of stuff. I think a lot of the feeding management integration would be interesting. Uh, feeding behaviors, um, feeding time changes, you know, way back amounts, uh, empty bunk kind of syndrome, you know, any of those kind of things. Any integrations there, I think, would be really interesting into into a model. I'm not sure how you do it, but. Uh, that's for you to figure out, not for me to figure out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, those are really good points, guys. You just triggered, uh, um, you just triggered something. The the um, at least the the first version of seven has to have some sort of a management model on the front end, um, and we're we're we think there's one out there we just have to go grab it and kind of massage it a little bit and the reason for that it won't be as sophisticated out of the gate as what you guys are talking about but the this model is dynamic so you can't just give it a 24-hour feed intake value and expect it to give you an answer it'll fail actually it just doesn't give you anything it actually has to have meals so we actually need some sort of uh, an environment behavior model to allow it to eat and we'll probably do it crudely at the beginning and have you guys kind of say do you have four major meals or five major meals or six major meals and then kind of let it you know, oscillate through the day in some uniform it's going to have to be some uniform manner until we can figure out how to do the non-uniformity that you're all talking about you know those are really good points that sounds like that, another that, input we got to put in there mike <laughs> Well, I'd like to, yeah, no, it is. I'd like to simplify it to, to that, to your point though. I don't know how to do the feed delivery thing. Cause I can't tell you when I'm doing dairy fellows case studies, how many time we walk, how much time, how many times, even now when we walk into a barn at, you know, we walk into a barn at, at eight in the morning, you see one thing, but we always come back to the barn somewhere between 11 o'clock at night and five o'clock in the morning, how many empty bunks we see. Right. Yep. And it, it just drives me crazy, right? And they can't figure out why they don't have any components, why they can't make any milk. Um, um, so I don't know how to do that one, but but we we do, um, I'd like to say, hey, are you in a six row barn, a three row barn or a four row barn? What percent overcrowded are you on the stalls? And kind of make it checkbox kind of stuff. And if you had any information on, you know, do you have rails or do you have headlocks? You know, just some things like that that allow us to kind of get to these bigger picture characterizations. We could probably learn to to make some behavior out of that. Trevor DeVries has some ideas. We've we've partnered, not we partnered with him, but we brought him, him and Rick Grant into these conversations and we're trying to kind of figure out how do we build a a behavior model that would get at some of that. So so Mike, I'm curious, what would constitute a major meal? Most of the major meals that I, that we see, no, that's a good question. And, you know, and I'm, I'm somebody can argue with me about this because I, and because I'm not going to fall on my sword on anything here, you know, feed, feed delivery in the morning, right? Is, is in having feed delivery there when the cows come out of the parlor yep. and having it fresh and ready. We know we get a lot of intake in that particular feeding bout, right? Consistent push up. Right. Every time we every time you push up, usually in a high cow pen, you got cows going back to to grab some food as long as they're not overcrowded. Right. Feed delivery again. Right. So you're and every time, you know, if you're milking three times a day, when they come back, you're always there's always a major meal on the back side of a trip to the parlor. Right. As long as their feed is pushed up and accessible and they're not too overcrowded. Yeah, so there's there's a few 
big indicators there that you that you can kind of use to kind of get at well how many meals should they you know so if you say you're milking three times a day well there's three meals you got feed delivery if it's once a day there's another major meal if you got a push up every every six hours where there's some more right so you can kind of get to a a bare bones kind of this is my this may be my intake pattern on this farm the, the hard part is is if they're running out of feed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night then you know, everything's off yeah well that's been... action will work well with that mike with some of these other companies right yeah well i'm that and that's you're right on those those collaborations can be really really important here and i think that's getting us into this era of you know for better or for worse we call it big data right just got to figure out how to grab it and make use of it and put it in a form that we can all use it there's a lot of computer people out there that would love to help us do that as long as we can figure out how to get it done guys it's been a great conversation i've enjoyed every minute of it but they just flicker the lights that means one thing it is uh uh last call so with last call what i'm going to do is ask uh, each of you guys to kind of give us <clears throat> a couple key takeaways um and and for the consultants i'm going to ask you to give us kind of a, a practical takeaway not only for yourself but for you know fellow nutritionists out there and then and then mike um maybe from more of a an academic perspective i'm going to ask you to close us out and, and give us an idea of what you think are some of the key um, elements of the, the, the new version or, or the conversation today. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. And so... With that, uh, Clay, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. So, so actually, some of it's what we hit on there at the end. So that you know, the dynamic uh, nature of the model. I think that's a uh, that's. Uh, I'm really looking forward to to that piece of it. Uh, certainly, from our perspective, and the um, and looking forward, the uh, and Mike, you hit on this at the end too. Was um, I get questions all the time about about predictions and particularly predicting milk components through the model so that's uh you know anything we can do there would would, would, would be a big help yeah rob a couple key takeaways yeah a couple that i got we didn't talk about it extensively but you uh, started out with the shift to the nitrogen basis on uh, everything related to protein uh, model i think that's great um and then i i really appreciate the sugar discussion and the protozoa coming out of that um that's something i haven't probably spent as much time on as i should so uh it's good to know and learn and and be a part of that and uh my last takeaway is that whenever I listen to Mike Van Amberg talk about models, it's really good to have a drink in my hand. So <laughs> it's more interesting. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Rob, I kind of messed up. I should have asked you in the very beginning, what are you drinking tonight? What's in your glass? Why don't you give us that now? Ah, uh, yeah. This is a uh, Wisconsin uh, brandy old fashion. So yeah. four bell brandy. Yep. Most of our Wisconsinites, that's what they have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mike, uh, what kind of uh, words of wisdom do you have for us? Well, I second the alcohol in hand. I appreciate that, Rob. <laughs> and what are you having tonight? I'm actually drinking a Jack Creek Pinot. Um, this is from one of my old clients who used to be a dairyman, and him and his wife, John and Shelly Lemstra, started a winery a couple of years ago, and it's one of my favorites. So that's what oh, I'm doing. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah, so some of my takeaways today, uh, you know, especially on the time points, I think we all kind of have a standard in our head of what we look for when we're comparing forages and things like that. And, and I think the model helps us put that into what we see with the cattle. Um, I, we've already been working on some of these, you know, earlier time points, like 12 hours and things like that. I think that that's where we're going to be able to go with this model. I'm excited about that from a from a fiber standpoint is being able to analyze these fibers and tell the differences on some of them too. You know, as we're starting into 20 right now, 
we had a really hot late summer. So we're seeing some of these fiber digestibilities in the toilet compared to where we were feeding on some of the 21 corn silages. So I think that's going to help us a lot when we're that, uh, when we're doing that. Um, we didn't talk a lot about this too, but kind of looking at those grams of essential amino acids per mega cal, you know, are we still focused on certain amino acids or as we're learning more about these feedstuffs, are there other amino acids that we need to be focused on? Um, trying to maximize components and yield in these cows. So, and, and just, you know, the overall, when you're, when you're using the model, uh, making sure that our inputs are correct on that. I, I'm, I'm really a stickler on that as far as trying to get weights and walking distances and things like that as we're moving forward. So I'm excited for this new model. It, it kind of, you know, when the new versions come out, the art part of it, Mike, that we, we do as nutritionists, we kind of have our, our standards of what we're looking for. And every time the model gets better, the art does go down and the science gets better. So um, I think we can actually look at how these animals are performing. And, and I always leave it up to the cows, like you said. The cows tell me whether it's working or not. So uh, this has been a great discussion and thanks for having me on it. Yeah, yeah well said, Mike, uh, well said. Dr. Van Amberg, final words. <laughs> thank you all for your patience. Um... No, thank you all for doing this. This is fun. Uh, you know, final words. Um, you know, this is, um, I am, you know, I'm surprised at what this effort has turned into, right? This is not anything that I ever, ever, ever envisioned. Um, I just knew that uh, in 2005, when the old guard was stepping down, that I was not enamored with building software. I was just wanting to be a biologist and we were just going to port that out to other people, you know, so hats off to the soft, to the licensees, you know, AMTS and NDS and everybody else, they've built software that you guys can use. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And um, I'm grateful for all the support that's allowed us to continue to do this. Right. So, yeah, I don't know if I have any real words of wisdom, but um, this has been a journey. And uh, it's still a journey. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm just, uh, it is not ever anything um, that I anticipated, um, but uh, it's been functional and useful. And I think it's helpful and we'll continue to do it. So anyhow, those are my parting words. Well, thank you for that, <laughs> Mike. Mike, this has been a great conversation. Uh, uh, very interesting. I want to thank you for the, the guests you brought along tonight. Rob and Mike did an amazing job, right? I appreciate the uh, uh, the academic conversation as well as the practical conversation. They did a great job of bringing that to bear. Uh, this is an important tool, right? Um, and we got, don't want to put a lot of pressure on you, Mike, but there's a lot of people out there waiting for it. So. <laughs> May it is. We're going to keep your, keep your feet to the fire. So. <laughs> they are. They are. All right. all right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate the Rob, discussion. Have to, maybe, maybe if, yeah, Rob, if I, you get I also, old fashioned, fashions, I'll do better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want it to, to, to go without uh, thanking our loyal listeners. You know, uh, I want to thank them for joining us tonight. You know, we're always looking for ideas, uh, topics that uh, you want to hear about. And so we'd appreciate hearing from you. If you would just send us an email at anh.marketing at balkan.com with, with any ideas, conversations, we'd really appreciate it. And, and with that, we, we hope you learned something. We hope you had some fun. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.